today. So first one we had live down in London, which was nice because we could actually see people, hug them, etc. Um, second one we did in April, um, and there's so much happened since then, you wouldn't believe. Um, so today's our third one, and the main aim really today is to try and kind of catch up with what's changed and some kind of key topics. So uh, forgive me, I am reading these out. So latest permitted development changes, biggest opportunity for residential developers now, because that's what you need to know. Uh, we've all heard about the stamp duties. That's ruled my life for the last week. So we'll talk about that. Future of commercial investors, really, really um, interesting what's going to happen in that sector. Uh, what to do when funding offers are withdrawn. I know that a lot of people have suffered with that. And how will the stamp, uh, uh, the stamp duty changes affect the market? So we've got tons to talk about, but I do have to say, I'm going to introduce the guys in a minute, but the most, most important thing is wherever you're watching from, all we're really here for today is to answer your questions. So however you would put forward questions, if you're on YouTube, Property Tribes, etc., Facebook, ask your questions. We'll, they'll come through to me uh, on WhatsApp. And I'll then be able to uh, make sure that we get your questions answered today, because that's all we're uh, that's all we're really interested in is helping you out during this massively tricky time. So now that we kind of got on and um, uh, explained that a little bit more, uh, we're going to go through. Um, if I can actually find out, oh, I've got so many screens on here, it's mania in this household. So uh, just introduce everybody. Uh, so our first person, and uh, everybody knows the oldest in the group, um, one of the most accomplished property deal makers, because uh, he's been around longer than everybody else, who has, uh, and you are all going to be jealous, you can't be jealous of this comment, over three and a half thousand properties bought or sold in the UK have gone through this man, three and a half thousand. Um, and one of the latest acquisitions of John's portfolio was a £26 million deal, which was funded by Hope England. So um, you're in safe hands here with a guy that is trusted by all sorts of people. Um, I can't always say that when you're talking about property investment stuff, um, making digs at anybody in particular. But next we have Paul Mahoney. Paul Mahoney is the founder and managing director at Nova Financial Group. Um, just the one who does have a bit of a strange accent, comes up with strange phrases every now and again, so <laughs> delights of an Aussie on our hands. Um, uh, but he is an industry-leading property investment, uh, financial advice, and what I would say is we were sort of chatting earlier, and um, Paul knows mortgages inside out and backwards, but more importantly for you, he is also an investment specialist. So he's very unusual because he links the investment side, getting a return on the money that you have, but then delivers that through um, properties and mortgages. So really different to most people that you will deal with. Uh, and we have the most gorgeous fella on the list, Tony Gimple. Um, if you don't, uh, I'm sure I should be smiling at this point. If you don't, I've got your hands up if you don't like paying tax. So let's have a few hands up here. Yeah, Tony loves paying tax. Absolutely. So he didn't put his hand up. Um, so Tony is your man, basically. He's a private rental sector commentator, speaker, but most importantly, advisor on tax and succession planning. And for anybody that read the press this morning um, and the possibility of a capital gains tax grab, you have not got a specialist tax advisor by your side. Please, if there's one thing you do after this call, go find one. Um, uh, hopefully that'll be Tony, but if it's somebody else, you won't mind. Uh, so really, really important. And then we have Richard Bush, uh, CEO of Crowdlords. Uh, that provides finance to help um, offer landlords much healthier returns um, and investors. Uh, and rather than necessarily going out and doing the job yourself, um, you've got a professional uh, organisation by your side to do it for you. So that's kind of everything we're up to. That's um, everybody that you've got, hopefully, a good idea um, in front of you as to, as to what they can make you to help. Um, but as I said earlier, we're here to answer your questions. So what we're doing at the moment is just giving you a little bit of information um, just to kind of warm you up a little bit. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and this might be a little funky, so bear with us, is I'm just going to give you an update um, on... Uh, sorry, I've got some here that... Right, I'm trying to press a button. Uh, I can't get to the button, but something else is 
So what I'm going to do is talk to you about where we are economically, um, because this is definitely, definitely going to impact um, on what happens into the future. So hopefully by some miracle of technology, albeit a little slow, um, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. So I can't see anybody else now. So can somebody shout to tell me you can all see that? I believe we can see that. Yes, yes we can see yeah, that, Kate. Yeah, all up. Marvellous. My Go for biggest it. fear of the uh, next two hours is now over. So what is the latest on the property market for uh, July 2020? Mm -hmm. Huge amounts has changed. So when I presented this before, uh, back in April, then everybody was fairly confident this was going to be what we call a V-shaped recovery. And you can kind of see that from the scenario. So I'll explain the side in a minute. They were thinking this was going to be over in a year, uh, six months, and we'd all be back to normal and everything would be fine. The kind of realisation has sunk in that that is not going to happen. And what you have in front of you here is the orange line shows, um, this is basically GDP, and if you think of it just as GDP is a measurement of how the economy is doing, they were expecting it to grow to uh, by about 8% over the next five years. And that might still happen on the upside scenario. This all comes from the Office of Budget Responsibility. So it's what the government and various other people use. So we might get that, but we're not going to be anywhere near there until or heading back to that line until either 2022. Mm -hmm. so before we were looking at a year, now we're looking at two to um, five years recovery. The central scenario, so that's sort of hedge your bets a little bit. We won't have an upside. There won't be a horrendous downside. And we'll be growing at around 5%. And again, that's going to take a little longer. So you're talking about two or three years being in a pretty um, uh, sizable uh, recession. And the real downside is if things go absolutely pear-shaped, it could be another five years. And if it is five years, that's kind of where we were. And we'll be living through what we had to live through during the last recession. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of what might come up. So I've given you these um, stats and figures here. So basically what you've just seen is the first line of GDP. Um, the bit that's important to you is inflation. So that's the second line. And what they're really suggesting is that inflation is not going to be a huge factor over the next few years, despite the money that's being put in. They're expecting inflation to be pretty low. The reason that's good is because if wages can keep the pace with this growth, then that means the rent uh, rent uh, will like to stay the same, so you won't lose money. Where inflation goes higher than people's wage growth, that's when you. The other thing that's incredibly important is that unemployment rate. So the top bit you've got is the central scenario, so that was the middle one. And you, what's really spooking everybody at the moment is the real fear of massive unemployment starting from October when the furloughs. So you can see on the central scenario that that's, they're expecting that to double this year. They're expecting, and this is the bit that's a different and why they're expecting us not to recover as fast as possible, that it will rise even further throughout 2021, and then it will take a lot longer to come back. So implications of unemployment. How many of your private tenants, for example, are going to be made unemployed and have you got insurance that will cover it? Um, important to check that and important if the insurance company will pay out some of the rent guarantee ones I don't believe have at the moment. Um, so that's you've got to think that if your tenant goes bust effectively, what have you got in your armory to protect your funding because you still aren't going to be able to get very fast um, and don't know what support the government's going to give. So those are kind of things to look at, but we are expecting to make a good years. You've got to um, basically make sure that you're protected throughout that time. Um, I put the uh, chart in on the unemployment just to show you how absolutely scary that is uh, expected to be. Um, hope often what you find with forecasters is they they kind of underrated or under suggested how bad this was going to be to start off with. I think they may have gone too far to try and kind of protect themselves and got too worried. So somehow that sort of Somewhere between the upside and central scenario, I am quite an optimist, so I will point that out um, at the moment, is likely to be um, where, where we get to. Um, from a property forecast side, uh, Savills have kind of come out with the boldest of um, forecasts on what's going to happen in the property market. 
you might look at that and say, right, so this year they're expecting all prices for all properties in every single region to fall by seven and a half percent. Um, and it, and and that's kind of that is quite blanket for me. Um, I I'm not sure. I'm a big fan of Savile's forecast, but I'm not sure that this is going to be right. No. The central one for seven and a half percent may be correct. London may fall less. Um, the northeast is actually the most interesting, and in that it might not fall that much because it's already nine percent lower than it was twelve years ago. So you've got to kind of look at these. But the interesting one, bearing in mind most of you will be in for this for the long term. Um, is that if you look at the end of this chart, you've got in yellow five year forecast and in orange the five year forecast. Basically, what Savills have done over the next sort of four or five years is said that based on their forecasts last year, they're not expecting the five year growth to be that different over a five year period. And that that's probably about right. That's about as best guess as we can make at this moment. Um, so, but you can see in London that that's actually looking over a five year period at a 4% growth rate. My view on this is totally ignore averages moving forward. It's all about individual uh, prices. I think some people won't fall in value at all, and I think others will fall by about 20%. And you've got to work out which that category. Currently, we are seeing some really damaging stats going on in the uh, in the news, and I think that's partly because they want to say that. But it's not. It is buzzing out there, um, and it's buzzing even more now that we've had the stamp duty cut. On that, just bear in mind, um, and Tony, just pick me up on this if I'm wrong when you have your chat. But Wales doesn't look like um, they're going to allow any concessions at all for domestic, like uh, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland. But here's where it gets really interesting. Home Track, another uh, organisation I rate, they're actually looking at house price growth up 2.5% year on year. Sales agreed, and this is really interesting, 4% higher than pre COVID. And that's despite having Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland closed. Um, we're expecting a rebound, obviously, in that activity. And on the back of this, despite the fact we all know we're going into a massive recession, and we all know that prices have to fall for some properties. They're still predicting over three or two percent price rise, which is why if you thought you were going to get a ton of deals and you're going into agents, they're probably not that interested. So, um, nationwide and Halifax data has been used and published. I just can't see how that can be accurate with the little data that they have. So really, my message is focus on your local agents. They are the only ones that know what can help. help. OK, well, I've got five estate agencies in Norfolk, uh, Fine and Country, which is a great, good brand, great brand. Uh, and it's more of an upmarket brand. And what we're seeing, we're super busy at the moment. Um, and what we're seeing is people who are thinking of moving in five years time, perhaps uh, up to Norfolk, Suffolk, Norfolk, are now doing it immediately. And I think they're doing it before the next lockdown. They want to get on with it because they feel there could be another lockdown. Who knows? Um, they realise they don't need to work uh, all the time from the office. They're going to be working one or two days from the office, maybe, maybe not at all, all work, working from home. And I think what this will do, Kate, and it may upset a few people who live in Romford and all around these areas, but I think this is going to balance up the property market. Because if you don't need to live, with all due respect, in Romford, Hornchurch, all these types of places just on the edge of London to get into London, then you can live in beautiful Suffolk, Beautiful Norfolk, Lincolnshire, Wales, wherever you want. And of course, yeah. the prices are half price. Half yeah, price. Like now, they're going to go up, obviously. And, and we're super busy. And, I, and we're already seeing gazumping going on and all sorts of things in Norfolk. So now this might be only short term at the moment. I accept that. But I think people are looking at quality of life. They want a better quality of life. They realise that they don't need to be in London. Um, of course, young people want to be in London uh, and with the vibe and everything else. And people will want to still go to the office one or maybe two days a week, maybe. But, I mean, I've got a lot of people of my age, you know, 38, 39, that sort of age. Uh, who are now, His nose is who are, growing, John. Yeah, thank you. Who are now saying that, um, you know what, I don't need to go to the office at all, John. You know, uh, so that's all changing. Now, I think uh, personally, we'll have a good run till about November. 
Uh, I don't agree with Savills. I don't see, and we know, and, and Paul's always saying this to me, and if there's one thing I've learned off Paul Mahoney, is the two things, well, two things. One, he's got two degrees, which is unbelievable as an Australian. And the second thing is that it is a micro market, and he's absolutely yeah. right. So, you know, in Norfolk, we are seeing prices go up. We're not seeing prices go down at all. And this Savills, you know, 5 7% drop or whatever this year, I'm not seeing that. I see a bigger drop next year in yeah. certain areas, but I don't see that at the moment. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And um, have you seen just over the last few days with the impact of stamp duty, have you seen much with that? Yes, I think I think that's given people more confidence. I mean, at the end of the day, stamp duty is a tax on mobility. It stops people <clears throat> moving around the country. And I don't think this tax is going to come back in the same form again, uh, under 500,000. And as for Rushi saying, oh, it's only till March, he's having a laugh, isn't he? It's going to be for two, two and a half years. There's no way it's just going to be till March. We're going to be in the mire next year and the year after. And they're yeah. going to need all the support they can get, property people are, to get to get the country going. Because as we all know, whoever, when you buy a property, on average, people spend 5% of the value of that property refurbishing it, improving it. You know, carpets, curtains, kitchens, all those things. And, they, and at least this government have realised Yes, so they're not always that bright, but they've actually realised that it's so in, the property market is essential yeah. to to the UK economy. Absolutely essential. Yeah. Uh, and I also think it's that. confidence. It's the confidence of consumers. If they uh, if they're confident enough to move, they're confident, like you say, to spend money. And um, that is half of it. So I agree with that. Um, yes. So that kind of looks at the resi side, but yes, um, yes. there may well be others uh, very nervous at the moment sitting on commercial. Where, where oh, you know, my. Oh, my goodness. I've got three shops in Colchester uh, in a row and uh, not one of them's paid me. Not one of them. Wow. Uh, my bigger tenants are now paying again. So that's great. But my smaller tenants, forget it. I mean, luckily, my pockets are relatively deep mm. and we can live with it. But uh, we've got no commercial rents coming in at all, hardly. And, and I don't see that situation change at any time soon. I, I was disappointed, uh, Kate, that you haven't mentioned about my haircut I had this morning because I went to Ipswich first thing, 8.15 my appointment was at the hairdressers, and I drove into Ipswich uh, and no one is about. I mean, no one is about. Yeah. And that's typical of most towns. Now, mar I think market towns, the smaller ones, are going to survive relatively okay. They get support from local people. You can drive in, you can park easy. Mm. The bigger towns, the cities, we are in for, I believe, what's happened in the last four months uh, has moved us on 10 years. 10 years. People working from home, as we've said already, um, not wanting to go to the offices on a regular basis. I mean, you've got a copy shop in the middle of, I was in Norwich the other day, mm. um, Sorry, I was in Norwich the other day. And if you've got a coffee shop in Norwich, there is literally no one about, you know, no people yeah. aren't shopping. They're doing they're just not going into these city centres because there's they rely on all the office workers and the office workers aren't there. And I think it's very, very serious. And anybody who thinks they're not affected, anybody who thinks is they're not affected probably is being naive. And the reason I say that is because if you've got a pension of any sort at all, Guess what these uh, pension, these pension companies, these insurance companies have done? They've invested it in office commercial property offices and they've invested it in pri A1 prime commercial. And both those are going to do go down at least 50 percent in rents. And to give you an idea of that, just to put it on a more sensible level. If, if, if someone if you bought a property for 500,000 and it's vacant, a vacant office, say 500,000, you got a tenant for £100,000 a year, you'll be thinking, you would have thought you're super clever uh, and you would have refinanced that and borrowed probably 750000 on the basis that it's worth a million because you've, you've doubled the value of it. Yeah. Yeah. That tenant's gone bankrupt. You now can't rent it for 100000 a year. You can't even probably rent it for 50000 a year. So, you know, you'll, if you've borrowed 750000 it's now back worth five hundred or worse still. 350,000, you're what's called underwater. And that is a very serious situation for a lot of property investors. Very serious. Insurance companies, I haven't got so much, I haven't got so much sympathy for because they're large and they'll survive. 
Um, but of course, I feel very sorry for all those people who have invested into those pensions because they will be seriously affected by this. Anyone who's got a pension on the whole will be seriously affected by the commercial property market. <laughs> Well, we've got, we are going to talk about that a little bit yeah. uh, as well later on, because there are still some options uh, that might not be quite so doom and gloom for you to kind of rush off and think the world's, the world's going to go to pot. So there are still some opportunities. Um, and do you think, uh, I know you're kind of quite close on the government side of things, the plans that they've got so far, have they gotten right? Should we have confidence in those? What else would you like to see them do? Well, I think, obviously, everyone loves wishing. Anybody giving money away, everyone loves them, don't they? So uh, it's very easy to go giving the money away. The way they've given money away and the speed that they've given money away, I think it's been very clever and very good. I don't think anyone can complain. In fact, you could say, you could say that they've been too generous, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of, I think, people taking advantage. The bounce-back loans, I know a number of people with bounce-back loans who've decided they're going to buy property with it. Um, pay the school fees with it and all sorts of things. But that's that's up to them. Of course, don't forget, it's all great at the moment. And I, I described it the other day like um, like an energy drink. So the government have thrown everything at it. Everyone's running around on on this cheap, cheap speed, as we call it in the racing industry. It's called cheap speed um, running around and uh, no problems. That is until next March or April when they start paying the loans back. And it yes, all, so next year and the year after are going to be very serious. And I think employment, goodness knows what it's going to go to. Nicholas Walworth's going to be gutted because Harrods have just got rid of 700 staff. So all those personal shoppers he used to go when he used to go in, he used to make a fuss <laughs> of him. They've all gone, probably, you know, 700 staff in Harrods alone gone. You know, I mean, these are big, big figures. And I know friends who have got businesses who are doing very well, but have still decided to get rid of 20, 30 people because yeah. they realise they don't need them anymore. Yeah. So it's and that not always the companies. That yeah. always happens in a recession. Always happens. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, always yeah, happens. You always have a, yeah. bit of a bit of a clearer. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, well, John, thank you very much. Somehow Pleasure. we've actually managed to do that in 10 minutes, which I think is a first between you and I, which is quite cool. <coughs> so I'm going to head over now to um, Paul. Paul, maybe if I could... Um, run a couple of those dying mortgage questions that we all want to ask and then we'll talk more about the kind of investment side of things yeah um, of so current ltvs for um loan to values for buy to let investors and perhaps have a chat at the rates and i, I suppose my big question are rates now at the absolute bottom um in which case even if you're paying a little bit more for a house that might not be such a bad mm. idea if you if your cost base is quite low could you perhaps address those and then we'll talk about <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so the mortgage market sort of post lockdown has bounced back really quickly. Um, surprisingly, obviously things kind of came to a halt um, at the start of lockdowns. Valuations weren't able to happen. Uh, most lenders now are, are kind of back in full swing. Um, valuations are occurring. I, I had personally had one done yesterday. Um, <clears throat> lenders have bounced back with good rates. Some at better rates and better loan to values than pre lockdown. Wow, okay. Which again is is surprising. I think there was yeah, so I think it's a good example actually of how the media can mislead people sometimes. Yeah. Because sometimes. there was lots of negative media. <laughs> uh well, a lot of the time, obviously, yeah. There was lots of negative media at the start of lockdown about lenders no longer lending at high loan to values. And I think a lot of it was based upon Barclays and Lloyds Absolutely. scaling back. But they're the they're the last people you want to borrow from as a as a landlord. Um, you know, they're the strictest lenders that they, they only want to deal with the A plus, you know, borrowers. And, and most landlords don't fit in that box um, or the properties they're buying often don't fit in that box. So that that wasn't the case. And I was constantly having to reassure people about that. Don't worry, the mortgage, the, the, the mortgage market is just on pause at the moment. It hasn't pulled back from the market. And that has luckily proven to be the case because it, it's, it's bounced back really quickly. Um, obviously, the Bank of England rate is the cheapest it's ever been. Um, however, I don't necessarily think that rates are the cheapest they can be because most lenders haven't passed on that cut in full. And I suppose potentially part of that is they've built in a bit of a risk buffer for themselves. Yeah. And perhaps that's why they still do have a very strong appetite for lending because it's more profitable for them. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. So I think it's a good thing. Lenders seem positive about the market. 
They're lending at the high loan to values again, as I say, some at higher loan to values than they did previously at, at quite good rates. So, so that that's a, that's a positive sign because you know, as you as you quite rightly say, Kate, even even if you're um, even if you're concerned about slight price movements over the next 12 months of, you know, let's say up to 5%, I still think if it's a good property in a good area, you're best off buying it now because if you're buying it for a five to 10 year time frame, that potential saving of 5% could actually end up being a potential loss of 5% as well because as, yeah. as everyone's just quite rightly said, the market's doing really well at the moment. And it's only speculation as to what's going to happen over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So that kind of leads into another good question then. So in your mind, bearing in mind the economic turbulence we have coming up, uh, which is beautifully explained by John, uh, then where do you, how do you assess somewhere that is safe to invest? What, what's safe to you? <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, again, I agree with what you were saying in your talk, Kate, with regards to the main concern being around job loss. <laughs> And then how job loss will flow on to property or demand for property, I suppose. Um, now, I think most people will agree with me that the areas or the locations that you'd be most concerned about will be locations with thin job markets. Yeah. Smaller, city, and smaller cities and towns in regional areas around the UK where they're quite often driven by one industry or even one major company. Now, that's a concern. Because if that one industry or one company shuts down or scales back or moves away, you're in trouble. Um, whereas if you're investing in a, in a large city with a broad range of industries and employers and much deeper um, employment markets, then you can have obviously have more confidence that, um, that you, the gaps will be filled. And, and do you think that still holds true, bearing in mind that John's comment as well about people maybe moving out of the cities? Um, I think it does still hold true. And, and, and I don't I, I, I see where John's coming from in saying that. And I think perhaps this, you know, certainly with John's generation, they would have that in mind. Oh, that's not. <laughs> no, and, and this, this isn't a jab. I this wasn't, isn't a jab. This isn't the truth. how long it would take. This is the truth. <laughs> okay. no, it I'm, always I'm comes up. I'm happy to go at you about that's, being old, John, even though you are getting on ages. Ages. But um, well, hold, hold, hold on, Paul. What I think. <laughs> Actually, though, what well, I'm just listening to what you're saying and what John's saying and, and cutting out the uh, bits, the, the, the sarcasm in between. What, what, of course, we're talking about is buy to let investment and what where we are, people are moving out. It is those people that are buying homes as yeah. opposed to those people that are renting them. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, it, you can kind of what I think is helpful to people is so much noise coming out of property from the media. It's trying to. Um, trying to be able to read that information that's useful and throw the stuff away that isn't. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I see where you're coming from. And, the and, idea and I do think, and, you know, I wasn't having a go at that, John, there, because I, I do think it is a generational preference um, in that older generations, yeah. ha, uh, first off, probably uh, are a bit more wealthy and therefore yeah. have a bit more attraction to buying a stately home further from the city. But secondly, Earlier on in life, they were more family focused. You know, they, they got had children early, they got married earlier. The dream was to have the large family home. Now, I think probably from kind of my generation down, that's not so much the case because so the, you, the that focus would make is you about twenty four, based on what. <laughs> based on what God said. <laughs> <earlier. laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think people are working longer hours, they're having children later, they're getting married later. The focus is more on having facilities and amenities on your doorstep yeah. and not so much on having yeah. the larger family home and travelling an hour to and from work every day. Now, I think that there will be a change due to this work from home situation, which I think will continue on in a much greater form than it did previous to COVID-19. But I think the main way that will impact younger professionals' preferences will be toward more livable properties, um, you know, larger floor plans, facing the right direction, dual frontage, all that sort of thing, which makes a place nicer to be because they're going to be there more often. Um, and therefore, potentially, the, the cheaper, older, dingy yeah. properties that previously rented really well because of their location may not so much anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that's, that's one of the ways that this will affect things. But I do think... There's been a long-term trend toward inner-city living, 
Um, you know, an example I quite often give of this, and I think it's a good one, is the Manchester City Centre 20 years ago. There was only a thousand people living there. Yeah. It was all retail and commercial space, and now there's 30,000. So that's a huge trend that's happened over 20 years. I don't think that's all of a sudden going to reverse because of the situation we're in now. I think it will just shift it a little bit. Yeah. So you'd be looking at, um, if you're looking at flats, it would be flats with com- with uh, communal gardens, outside space, a shop Facilities, on site, yeah. maybe that kind of thing. So having the amenities close by. Idea. Okay. Sorry, very, very quickly. I did say that um, people, younger people will want to work from their offices. In yeah. London, you know, in London, they will want to work locally in London. They won't because they're like the bus yes, and everything it else. And it's the older type of person, to be fair, who will be moving out. Yeah. 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 And I think what you're highlighting as well is the importance of really understanding your target market. Yeah. yeah. Who, who is it you are going to grab? Um, and really, you've got to get that right. If you get your proposition and your target market mixed up, there's nobody's going to look up. You're not going to you're not going to ride the market over the next 12 months. You, no, you're going to fall off. So and and the, I think that ties back into your question quite well, Kate, is the, the, the way in ensuring you're absolutely safe is by buying and owning very rentable properties, regardless of the state of the economy or the, you know, the climate, the political climate, all that sort of thing. If yeah. your property is rented, you're safe. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, yeah. the easiest properties to rent are centrally located, desirable properties close to lots of employment facilities and amenities. They'll rent every day of the year, even in a major recession. Yeah. And, so and therefore, they're bit more amenities. <laughs> and, <laughs> we have amenities here. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll learn your language one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, we've not just got COVID. There's a little thing that we haven't spoken about for a little while, and everybody's going to groan when I it. it. But it's starting to come over, which is, as John has kindly interrupted me for, right. uh, Brexit. So Brexit, COVID, how on earth are those two going to kind of collide and a landlord still be successful moving forward? Yeah, oh, look, I, I think it, it's a good progression of what we've just been talking about, because the concerns around Brexit are somewhat similar to the concerns around COVID-19 in that, you know, um, economic instability. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, and, I, you know, how they collide is anyone's guess. You know, whether Brexit is short term bad and long term good or vice versa, or it's all good or it's all bad. No one really knows. But it's happening. So we have to we have yeah. to deal with it. And um, I suppose, again, it, my view on that doesn't change too much from what I've just said, is if we're investing for the mid to long term, in you know what John referred to before as microclimates, yeah. Um, oh, my phone. Okay. What John referred to before as microclimates, with strong individual driving factors that are somewhat external to the overall property market, um, because you know we, we looked at the prediction before of the UK property market. You know that's I think that's almost irrelevant to an individual landlord. Yeah. Well, almost misleading, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, because, you know what, none of us, you know, regardless of how wealthy we are, we can't buy the UK property market. Yeah. Um, we can only buy individual properties in individual areas, which are driven by individual driving factors. So, you know, um, I can give some examples, but I don't think it's all that relevant. I, you know, focusing on areas that have, you know, strong infrastructure spending, strong job growth, really strong reasons for people to want or need to live there, based and, and that, that moving in the right direction, creating new things, you know, positive growth and change, all of those things give more confidence in performance regardless of the overall market. Yeah. And that's and the I type have, of things that we yeah. look for. Yeah, and I have to say, uh, Paul and I have worked quite closely on a couple of projects, and it is the bit that I think is missing in the property sector is the link to finance. Um, so people are very good at training you on doing deals or making money or all this, that and the other, but there's no point doing that unless it meets your financial objectives. Yeah. The end yeah. of the got a pot of money 50 grand 100 grand 150 grand the biggest mistake and you cannot afford to make this over the next couple of years is investors and landlords that don't say i've got 50 grand and this is what i want to deliver with it by when and the lovely thing about working with somebody like paul is that he will help you from that early stage and help you then understand how to deliver it and then you've got people like john nicholas and richard 
who can help you look at different ways of doing it as well as an, and other ways other than buy to let. So it's really crucial. Um, and the other thing, just to, to build on Paul's point, is when you're looking and thinking, well, how do I find these safe places? The best way to do it is start off in your own area. And if you go and look on the sole property price data, which is freely available on Rightmove, Zoopla, um, the land registry, one of the things that I always look at is if I'm looking at a pro buying a property or selling a property, um, is you've got ha individual house price data by road going back to 99. That's 20, over 20 years. And what you can see is if you have a look between 2007 and 2013, have a look to see how well that property performed because some crashed by 50% and some haven't recovered still and some only crashed by 5 or 6%. And what Paul's referring to is go find those 5 or 6% falls um, because they're the kind of safe safe houses on good roads and that that's not going to change is that i think that's what you're saying paul i think that's the right only caveat i'd say i agree with everything you've said there Kate. i think the only caveat i'd put to that is places like birmingham and manchester didn't fare that well in the last recession but okay. they are substantially better locations than they were then now yeah, yeah that's that makes sense they're more robust cities now than they were 10 years ago yeah no i so think that's, that, that's, that's something that's worth fair. considering too yeah yeah that's true um thank you very much right we're going over to the uh hold your excitement here because we're going over to tony now to talk about <laughs> um and i know the others will agree that all our presentations are important but guys you do not get your tax sorted out in the next few weeks or months you are going to get raided you've heard it here i started talking about this back in 2005 six people thought i was a bit of a nutter but I was right then and I'm absolutely right now. And I'm only telling you because I'm trying to protect you. So, Tony, um, I guess the first question is, we've got a bit of a tax break, which hasn't happened for about 10 years. Um, yep. And that's with the stamp duty um, thing. So is that really great for investors or where, where do you sit on that? And what do you think will happen? Will it extend beyond March 2021? Because that's the first question. I think it will extend beyond March 2021. <laughs> Uh, you know, to have the stamp duty threshold, whether you're a residential buyer, whether you're running um, a portfolio land or business, whether you're, you know, in investing in resi property, then not having to pay stamp duty until you get to that half a million barrier can only have highly positive outcomes. You know, people will move, money will move around society. Um, as John rightly said, they'll be spending 5% of the property value, you know, on all of the refurb, all of the other taxes. And, and the, 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 the big issue, I think, is to stop treating um, landlords as barely one step removed you know, from living off immoral earnings. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I've probably over the last five years must have spoken to pick in five thousand different types of landlord you probably count on the fingers of one hand uh, how many of those you know were a little dodgy maybe yeah well i mean i i say to people and i must admit i get absolutely slam dunk for it but i've met people who are nurses doctors are always big landlords yeah. uh, people in the armed forces tend to yeah. go into being a landlord um uh priests because they live in properties and they have nowhere to uh, that that basically come as part of the part of the, the yep. church whatever they're looking after and i yep. get so slam dunk for saying anything like that but it is true and um i've tried very hard to get people away from this anti-landlord thing but i have to say that that it is still an agenda that everybody wants and i think a lot of the time is it's so that the government isn't taking flack for its policies well, yeah. you know, the, 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 the next election is, what, four years away, something like that? Yeah. All right, so, and whatever happens, government will take flack. Yeah, yeah. But you've got some real, you know, structural issues here in, in that we haven't had enough house building since the war. Uh, uh, demand exceeds supply. Um, so things like stamp duty, treating the market more fairly, getting the population, you know, back to social mobility um, has to be the priority of the day. Yeah. You know, Brexit, I mean, you know, for Pete's sake, you know, we're a maritime trading nation. 
uh, you know, <laughs> people are still going to come here regardless of whether we're in Europe or not. We're at the crossroads of the world. Yeah, but the yeah and I, I think that's been quite proved because we've got people like Nissan staying and yeah. lots of other organisations that, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, my old place, Unilever, they're looking at taking the Dutch, bringing it over to England. So yeah. there's a lot of positive stories, but again, they're not being, uh, they're not being reported that widely, yeah. I don't think. Well, you know, I suppose we we could go on about you know the, the, the way that the uh, press has become the opposition and that it's drifted somewhat left of centre. But that's not the point of uh, you know today's uh, webinar. Uh, yeah. the, so yeah. talking about what the state's up to, um, obviously it's put all of this kind of money in, and yeah. Yeah. that's that's going to have to be clawed back. We've seen the. Um, uh, the headlines this morning that uh, they're looking at maybe rate, they're reviewing capital gains tax. Um, I, and that's why I'm saying you've got to talk to a tax expert now, because that, that's pretty potentially scary. Do you want to highlight what was the what was being proposed at the last election when they were looking at matching capital gains tax rates to income tax rates? Well, yeah. is is a capital gain an income? I don't think it is. You know, it, 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 it's a game based on either active or passive speculation. You know, the, the, the one change there should be is when it comes to how HMRC treat dividends. Dividends are income. And so to have a lower rate of tax for dividends when you're working in that business as opposed to just being a, a, a passive investor is crazy. It is outdated. Um, so you, so you, you've got, and you've got a situation where it's blown back, in that, it, if you're running a, a company, you're taking dividends, you're doing so to minimise your personal taxation, you're finding it harder to get a mortgage, you can't get government support, you, know, you can't, you know, you effectively not going to be able to furlough yourself. So there are all sorts of inequities just within paying less tax on dividends. CGT, you, you've 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 made a profit through something outside of your control, uh, and it's just another way that the you know government can help ba balance the books. We're hearing some uh, chatter on what government might do about inheritance tax. Yes, that's a quite a critical one, isn't it? That is a critical one. Uh, and and to suddenly levy inheritance tax on trading businesses. Well, it'd be turning the clock back a hundred years. Why on earth, or for wealth taxes generally, why on earth would you take all of the risk of building a business only to see it pass out of your hands or during your lifetime to be taxed? Because again, you know, you, you've been good at what you do, created employment, helped others pay tax, and suddenly you know, you, you're getting stuffed on a wealth tax. Okay. So just let, let's bring it sort of as a practical note to uh, those on the call at the moment in terms of what should they, what should, what's the minimum sort of tax and planning stuff that, what, what are the three things that they should have in place? And if they haven't got in place now, get in place straight away. All right. One, uh, they need to have in place, uh, if they're in property, which is, I guess, why they're, what, what, why they're listening to this webinar, uh, is to have a specialist property accountant who can look forward and not backwards that is the number one thing right. number two look at areas that are going to give you good yield on your property um i rental yields not speculation real uh, yields do the job properly and then talk to the accountant about how best you know to structure it going forward right. make and then make prudent provision for what your tax bill is going to be. Yeah. And what about things like wills and trusts? Where? Oh, well, estate planning, succession planning, yeah, everyone's going to die. Fact. Yeah. 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 Uh, two thirds of the adult population hasn't bothered to write a will. Uh, even a higher percentage doesn't have a power of attorney for their property and financial affairs, let alone their health and welfare. Uh, so if nothing else, you know, uh, do a simple will, leaving everything to each other. You know, if you're married or in a civil partnership, um, try and spend it all before you go. Um, 
<laughs> but if you can't, look at it in the round. Yeah, again, bring the whole thing together, the property portfolio, your personal circumstances, appointing somebody to speak and act on your behalf if you can't, you know, not quite dead, but not quite alive. Um, don't try and do it yourself. Don't shop around purely on price. It's not what it costs, it's what it buys you. Yeah. Meanwhile, the stamp duty stuff, buy whilst you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, 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 don't overly rush. Uh, in rural Sussex, we're unfortunate enough to live. You know, we, we've seen uh, a lot of more, a lot more properties come on the market. Prices are actually rising, not falling. Uh, the local agents are as busy as anything. You know, and you're seeing properties that were over the half million bracket now coming down. And the nice. ones that were under it actually going up. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very strange, very strange position. Okay. That's great. And as I say, I can't, one of my biggest frustrations when I'm on social media is the amount of investors and landlords that post. Please, can somebody help me with, have I got my CGT calculation correct? Should I be in a limited company or um, should I invest personally? Please, can you yeah. tell me? Nobody nobody should be posting yes no whatever every single post on there should be go seek specialist well, tax advice yep. and if you don't i'm really sorry but you are gonna get caught yep. out because the government is gonna have to get somebody to pay for all the money that's going out and they will come after you first you're gonna be at one of the top of the list so it's really join you it looks like everyone's still on so that's good right Thank you for staying. Thank you very much for staying with us. Apologies for the uh, technological problems. Um, so we're talking to Richard at the moment from CrowdLord. Uh, and um, I was saying that Richard is, is literally got people's money and investing projects in today's kind of scary, merry world that we live in at the moment. Um, so if you've got projects that are lined up, um, accepted by the vendors, for example, uh, and they're lenders with withdraw for any reason what what sort of advice what sort of advice and help can you give Richard because you're dealing with this day to day um Kate before I answer that just to address the point you made about it being a scary moment um I think one of the things that everyone agreed with earlier is that there is no market so whilst on average there, there is an issue um every single project or every single town or every single property is in a different environment and is facing a different challenge um, you know, we've had projects recently where after the lockdown, they've sold quicker than they were selling before the lockdown. Wow. Um, yeah. Where we go with the idea of property prices crashing by 7.5% across the board. So I think we all agreed that, you know, there is no market, that there will be challenges, uh, but those challenges are very specific to micro market. Even individual properties in individual towns is, is not an average. And um, so I just wanted to make that point. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, yeah, I know you're right. You're very right. I think for me, though, it's still for somebody like you that's highly experienced. You you know how to address these things, but for those, this is still scary. Whatever they're doing, but you're right. The the point of partly the point of today is to is to help navigate people through, help you out there to through what's going on. So can completely take your point. But for quite a few of us, it's a little scary if we haven't. Got yeah, yeah that, you know, it is. It is a little scary as well for, for us. <laughs> like you, say, you know, we are responsible for, for people's, we're not responsible, but we have an, enabled people to invest their money into projects that, that we've arranged. So we do take it very seriously and we monitor every project very closely as a result. But, but coming back to your question about people that are in the middle of projects, they're about to start a project and they have, they've had the offer withdrawn. I can completely understand why some lenders have done that. You know, it, it is that, like we've said, we don't know what's going to happen next year or the year after. And they're just being prudent. And they're being cautious. And often, not by their own choice, they're being cautious because their funders are no longer allowing them to lend their money. Every lender gets the money from somewhere. And so across the board, there's uncertainty. And so people are being more cautious. The question is, what do you do if you're a landlord about to buy a, a property or you're a developer about to buy a project? And you've had your um, funding withdrawn or, or lessened to what it was. It might have been they were offering 75% loan to value. They're now only offering 60%. So what do you do? And I, I think the first thing that people should do is to reassess the project. You know, it is an opportunity, uh, given that the purchase hasn't yet happened, 
to reassess the project under the new environment, under the current environment and what's predicted for the next year or two. And it might be better to walk away. You know, developers and landlords don't like walking away from projects. <laughs> trying to make it work, something that doesn't work, trying to make it work. So it could be an opportunity in that respect. If having reviewed it, you still think it's a good project and you still want to go ahead, then I guess the challenge is how do you make it work? How do you make it work when you can't borrow as much as you were looking to borrow? Um, and it could be that you reassess the project. It might have been a house that you were converting to HMO. Um, given that the, the, the lower income market is the market that's going to be hit hardest over the next year or two, it might be better to change that HMO and flats as opposed to sell them. So you might change your strategy based on um, triggered by the, the lenders changing in heart. And that change in strategy might change the lender's um, assessment of the deal as well. So it's good to understand why the lender has changed their, their terms and it might be that you can still make it work. However, you know, you can't make something, what's the expression about lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig, whatever it is. You know, if it's a bad deal now, it's still a bad deal. And, and so um, it's best to walk away. If it does work, then you can always find additional finance from somewhere. It might be that you go to friends and family and you boost your own capital, so you need to borrow less. It could be that you come to a platform like ours and you look to raise some debt or some equity so that it can go ahead. Or you might simply try new lenders. Some lenders are still offering 75% loan to GDV. Others are now down at 55%. So, you know, it's not the end. It, there's always an alternative that, that you can find if you look around. Okay. And I guess moving on from that, in terms of investing in a platform like yours, for example, rather than going and choosing your own project to invest in, sort of is, is this a better time to do that? Because you, you've got somebody else looking at this project for you, or particularly for the first time investors, I think. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Kate. I think my recommendation to all our investors is, is to, we've done our due diligence, other platforms have done their due diligence, but do your own due diligence. So it, it's not, it's not uh, I would never suggest to people, go onto a platform, trust what they're saying, uh, take their assessment as being right for you and make that investment. It is down to you to determine whether it's a good investment or not. That, that's the, the most important thing. Having said that, one of the advantages of crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending enables you to diversify. One of the things that we've talked about earlier is how there are micro markets and, and you know, one end of the street might go up and the other end of the street might go down. Absolutely. Um, one advantage of this method of investing is it allows you to spread your risk across multiple towns, across multiple regions, across different types of investment. And you couldn't do that on your own. If you've got £50,000 to invest, You've got to choose which property to invest that into. On a platform, you can spread that across 10 investments and therefore you mitigate the, the impact of any downturn or upturn. So that's probably the, the, the biggest advantage of using a platform like ours in the current market. And what do you think are the kind of top three due diligence um, tasks that people should be doing when they read a pack? That's a really good question. I think... Um, I'm not a fan. Well, I don't just ask easy questions. No, no you <laughs> never ask easy questions, Kate. Um, I, I, I wouldn't like to say top three because it depends on what it is you're investing in. Um, but, but I think what, what you need to look at is the local market. Because as we've all said when we've talked about where we're going to buy or what we're going to invest in, it isn't a national market or a regional market, it's a local market. So wherever the investment is, Look at that market. Look at the investment that Paul talked about. Look at the employment that we've just discussed. You know, if it's in the middle of Derby and we know Rolls Royce have just laid off seven and a half thousand people, is there enough employment locally to make that still a, a property that you'll be able to rent? Yeah. Understand the local market, and then understand. I think the the financials within the investment. So, you know, some people work on a. 18% margin on developments, other people 25%, other people 35%. Where you have the greater margin, you have more um, room for things to move and you can still make a, a good profit. So I think it's about detail um, as opposed to taking general comments from people like us that are, that are generic and are not specific. Yeah. If you do your due diligence, it has to be very specific. 
that, that property and that investment in that town at that time. Okay. And I guess just sort of with your wider experience and stuff, what when you're looking at projects, are you changing your kind of criteria from, um, I suppose, a social change perspective, for want of a better phrase, in terms of, you know, um, if you're just building flats and there's no communal gardens, you ain't getting anything now. And, you know, where, where are you, what, 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 what criteria are you starting to change, putting more value to perhaps would be a good question. Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, I've read a lot about social change and we've talked about people now working from home. Everyone's moving to Norfolk, apparently, according to John. Um, <laughs> You know, the facts, they're the facts. I can't help the facts. Uh, or, or Ipswich. They're moving yeah. to Ipswich uh, as well. Social change. And, you know, whilst we all have a view on what tomorrow will look like, um, I... they're coming for you. Police are coming, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Just enough. I think, yeah, yeah, social change takes time. And, um, I personally think, and I know Paul often writes about this, is that if you have a strategy that's a longer term strategy, then it's ro it should be robust enough for local fluctuations and, and things that will change now and again. Social change is something that you can look back on and you can comment on, but I think anybody who looks forward and says, you know, in the future the high street won't exist and in the future nobody will go to school, they'll teach children at home, etc. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and this year has been interesting because changes have happened so quickly and so dramatically. Who the hell would have known that? And yeah. so try and predict what's going to happen in a year's time, I think is foolhardy. Um, I think it's better to focus on what you know and, you know, and look at the facts, um, understand what the investment is in the local area, understand what the market is in the local area, I understand what the changes are in the local area. Um, I'm going to go and buy houses in Norfolk if there's any left. Um, well, rather there aren't than many, there aren't many, but we can still we can still fit you in somehow, Richard. Probably <laughs> quality person like you. Yeah, we'd be good neighbours, I can tell. <laughs> um, yeah. So personally, I'm not a great fan of trying to predict the future. But having said that, you know, I think, uh, for example, we won't do any commercial. <laughs> mixed use developments at the moment because of the uh, yeah. challenge of commercial. Now, there are things that you can do, that decisions you can make that are, that are in the light of changes that are or things that we're not sure about. So best to get on what you know as opposed to what you think. Yeah, yeah, and really, as you say, uh, each of you have reiterated so far, check out. It's all about the clever bit with investing is understanding that local market better than anyone else. Yeah, that's, that's okay. yeah. Um, Nicholas, you've been very patient uh, sitting there on your green screen. Um, so what do you think? I think the, the, this comes back to um, the kind of real doom and gloom potentially about commercial at the moment. But there is a little bit of a light, for commercial, uh, light at the end of the tunnel for commercial investors potentially, um, particularly in really, really tough supply and demand areas for housing. Um, because of the permitted development right changes. Do you want to kind of explain what they are and, and talk through where maybe you're not quite as sad as John might have made out earlier? <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's interesting with the, the proposed permitted development rights, and they, you know, a lot of them are yet to be 100% formalised, but the, the essence of them is you know, extending on things like the PD rights that have been in existence for a few years now, like the office to residential conversions and you know, bigger extensions on your home and all these extra PD rights that they've, They've kind of afforded, um, you know, homeowners and property developers alike um, to recycle old properties. Um, you know, it was the sort of rundown, not not always rundown, but often rundown offices that were kind of getting put out of business by these grade A offices being put up in town centres. You know, I operate in the southeast of England in the Thames Valley areas and places like Reading where it's got Crossrail. There's big new tower blocks coming up with beautiful serviced accommodation and um, serviced office accommodation and shared office accommodation. And, you know, you can take whole floors, you can take a cubicle. And those kind of office spaces are making it harder for smaller serviced, uh, serviced office uh, spaces or smaller offices to kind of compete and get, or compete for tenants. So when they get a bit worn down, you know, they weren't spending the money on them because it needed huge refurbishment costs to bring them up to the standards of these other incredible buildings that are being built around. So recycling of um, commercial property is is key with these permitted developments. You know, just leading on from what John said there completely, you know, ultimately there's going to be a lot of 
a lot of problems in the commercial world, a lot of a lot of vacancies, um, and you know that's I guess very sad to see. And whether it's the social change that you guys have been discussing, um, that's you know maybe people are going to be going to offices less, going to the high street less. The high street's been in decline for a number of years. In any event, um, you know Amazon. I think I read yesterday has bought eight new Boeing seven four sevens or whatever it was to to be able to deliver their goods because of online shopping. So all of this is kind of compounding into the government, you know, seeing that. And, you know, this is a sign that the government is saying, this is happening, guys, you know, backing John up here on, you know, the commercial problems that, you know, that are out there or, or will be out there. The government's seen that a long time ago. I want to say a long time ago, a month or two ago. And they've already started rushing through these permitted development rights to allow us to potentially change shops or shops on the edge of town centres um, without full and uh, rigorous planning permissions. Um, and the same goes for the sort of the office to residential market. That's being extended by things like um, extra floors. So um, I think it's due to come in on the 1st of August. Um, yeah. And again, to watch this space, it's, it's not set in stone as far as I'm aware, but I, I think it's the 1st of August they've indicated. And um, buildings um, over three stories, so three stories or more, I should say, will now be allowed under prior notification, which is this permitted development route. It's a more lax route of planning. They will now be able to add up to two stories extra, um, provided the overall height of the building doesn't exceed 30 meters, I think it is. Um, and also the building has to have been built between 2048 and 2018, I've noted down there. So there's some, there are some requirements coming out for it, which is good, which means it's, you know, it's definitely happening. Um, that works brilliantly for me, um, incidentally, um, on our site at Newbury. We've got a 42-unit micro studio scheme there. We've applied for planning twice and appealed twice and been failed for a single story. Now we can whack in a double story under permitted development. So, you know, so what, what that goes to... Coming out. And just, yeah, just, what, just, just on that, Nicholas, um, one of the things that I picked up um, is that do you think they're going to tighten the building regs a little bit more? There's a real fear, and for anybody out there that's maybe thinking of kind of looking at doing a, an easy conversion, if you like, there is a point about the and a worry, and I think it's fair about the quality of some of these conversions. Um, I know that uh, some have been done on a window basis, and actually, I did a problem on that with Radio 4. And, they weren't as bad as people necessarily thought, but they've stopped that now. Do you think they'll tighten building regs? Because I think permitted development right is all very well, but you still have a lot of building regs and you should still be providing quality um, yeah. for the future. Otherwise, you're going to increase your maintenance and refurb costs in the future, surely? Uh, oh, no, absolutely. And I agree the quality needs to be there. And I think, um, you know, also, can I just ask, sorry for the earlier cutoff, everyone. Can we ask lots of questions in the chat to everyone? Yeah, not we getting do that many have. A huge amount of questions. Do we have a huge amount coming? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we'll so, keep them coming, guys. We want to keep Kate busy at Q&A at the end. Uh, we've we're, we're <laughs> got a lot. You can send us some more, but we're going to struggle to get through them all already. Right, fine. That's good. I'm glad they're coming in. Keep, yeah, it, yeah, keep it going, guys. So, yeah, to answer the question, Kate, I think building regulations are quite tight, to be honest. I don't think yeah. the issue is necessarily the building regulations themselves. I think it's maybe the people adhering to those building regulations and just not doing building regs for a dodgy conversion. That could be issues. Um, obviously, that's extremely bad practice. It's dangerous. It's, you know, yeah. potentially risky and criminal to your tenants to not build yes. to an extremely high quality. So um, I'm not sure building regulations themselves are at fault. Yeah. They've got tighter over the years with things like Grenfell. There's much tighter fire regulations. There's all this stuff in place. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, the, the um, people that are doing these conversions, it's important to know that they are done, to, they should be done to new build standards. And that's what the building regs generally allow for. Um, so you need to be a bit careful when you're taking on a project that it's done yeah. correctly. Things like acoustic flooring and, and acoustics between the buildings is a contentious point, um, as is windows and, um, you know, all the new kind of... Um, I guess, eco-friendly stuff and U-values and EPCs and, and SAP calculations, all this stuff's And I guess size it? as well, you know, kind of, yes, so there's a place for the micro, but, you know, listening to, to Paul, and, Paul and Richard, it's also about thinking that people may need that office space at home. So maybe maybe less is more in the future, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, live, live work units are cracking, you know. And, we, you know, when we design our units, which are, you know, micro studios, they're only just sub- the normal studio size and they're extremely well designed to have you know you know office and desk areas um it's it's kind of 
you know, I believe in good quality space design as well. And, and if you build to a high standard with good quality space design, you can create something that feels twice as big. Um, and of course, in the, in the right conversions, I think it comes down to picking the conversion, um, you know, you can have a lot of uh, high ceilings. So you can create this voluminous feel. Some of our units um, and, and build sites have had mezzanine areas, for example. So although the overall small, you know, the floor area down below might be only sort of 20, 22 square meters, we're adding another 10, 15 square meter mezzanine, which creates it, you know, over and above a normal studio, in fact. So there's lots of opportunity with offices. I think going back to the, the, the sort of PD rights question there, um, you know, great to have new, you know, um, floors being added to some of these bigger buildings, um, there were, you know, shops and all this kind of stuff. But the problem with planning has always been at the local authority level, and that, that's the issue. Um, they still have reason to refuse some of these applications. Under the current PD, um, and these new PDs will be the same, and it, it's very much under the prior notification route, where you have to sort of prove highways, contamination, flooding, um, noise and noise contamination, acoustics, that kind of stuff. So, you know, the council could quite easily say, mm, we don't think you've got enough parking requirement, or, you know, you've got too much parking requirement. You know, they can make their mind, they can do what they want. Um, and they do do what they want. You know, Reading Borough Council don't want any car parking. Newbury Town Council want, um, which is West Berkshire, they want um, the full new build um, 0.75 per space for every studio um, parking. So, you know, they make up their own minds. And actually, if they want to refuse it because they don't like it, they're still going to try and do that. Um, you may well get through on appeal, but they, they, they can still make your life difficult. So it's not a foregone conclusion, PD, right? Um, I just hope the local authorities take the advice from the government and take the message from the government that we need more housing, we need to loosen these things up to create more you know, good quality accommodation um, yeah. of, like you say, reasonable size. And I guess sort of last sort of couple of questions, maybe to bundle them together a little bit more time. Um, best opportunities, you think, for residential developers and then to kind of tag on that, where, where do you think HMOs sit in the future as well? Yeah, and I think, you know, we've touched on a couple of the good opportunities here is, is the relaxed PD rules are a massive, massive, massive opportunity. Office to resi has been a huge opportunity for the last few years. Um, if you've got existing buildings, you can get another two floors without any planning. That's like unheard of in, yeah. in planning history. You know, um, you know our, our building's 10,500 square foot. So what's that? It's roughly 3,500 square foot per floor. So we've got 7,000 square foot potentially um, of you know, rights to go and build these floors subject to the prior notification. Um, I think the shops area, you know, recycling shops that aren't doing well or not in prime high street areas, you know, on the fringes of the high street or the ends of the high street, stuff that has always maybe struggled to let anyway, those will become ripe um, for picking for investors to go and recycle those into good uh, quality uh, residential accommodation. Um, and I think, you know, good stock coming to the market is is going to help i mean the pd rights really worked the first time around in my opinion you know there are some ba horror stories of badly converted offices and whatnot but i think you know like everything we've discussed today that's not the majority um yeah. you know building regs still come in and kick in at new build quality so as i said i don't think it's the building regs issue it's, it's down to the developers doing it um and pd might attract um more of a mainstream market that isn't quite so professional so i accept there's a concern there but I think that's for the local authority to deal with. And I don't think it's widespread, um, you know, as much as there might be the odd bad story out there. So I think, you know, the opportunity is there to, you know, help the housing market, you know, recycle stock, um, inject more people into an area. And if the high streets are struggling, you're better off having, you know, 60% the size of the high street with more people that live on it that are going to use the shops than 100% with half of the shops vacant, for example. So, um, yeah, I think... It's an interesting market and, and one that I'm looking forward to getting stuck into um, over the next few months. Yeah. Um, um, and then we have actually got a lot of questions on HMOs, so I don't know who'd like to answer okay, yeah. this. Do you want to just tell us your view? So are HMOs worth it? There are some questions on how do you deal with self-isolation. So we produced industry guidelines um, under the Home Buying and Selling Group and Lettings Industry Council, and we have a whole sheet which explains how to deal with the current rules uh, under HMOs. So um, if you go into property checklists, you can find that in there. Give me a nudge if you need some help. But we have actually done all the guidance on that, so I'll cover that question off. But good market, bad market for HMOs for the future. 
Yeah, definitely. I'd say I'm not going to go into the detail of specifics of running running the buildings. Um, the councils also, the individual councils also give good advice and, and guidance as to what they kind of expect. Um, go to Kate's site and, and download all that info there. That will give you some really good practical guidance on running and managing things in the current climate. But in terms of the general market, I think I'm going to reiterate a little bit what, what Paul said and, and what's been covered so far is that you know it's all about the area and people, you know, when they go into HMOs or consider investing in them, they also look at um, you know, is this area oversaturated? That's a big question that people have. You know, what, how can you, um, you know, quantify the demand? And it's, it's exactly the same process and due diligence that you'll go through as you would with a, a single buy to let. You know, it's looking at the infrastructure, looking at the offices and buildings and, and um, industry and professionals, or if you're doing a professional market that's in that area. Um, if it's a student HMO, of course, HMOs is a broad term, but, you know, depending on what you're using it for, students, obviously, a um, little bit of a concern in the student market. I'm not an expert in student HMOs. I don't really like that model. Um, I don't like the cyclical model. I don't like the dependence on universities and what they decide to build and how the way they house. Yeah. Um, it's not my kind of investment. I'd rather do the professional market, which is then just driven by basic supply and demand at a different price point to people that may be able to afford a one bed apartment and all the bills, which could be sort of 1500 quid in the you know, Thames Valley area, could be anything from 1000 to 1500 quid by the time you add in all the bills. Okay. Um, you know, the HMO market, and if it's a good quality professional HMO, um, which is some of the ones we do, um, you know, good en suites, really nice big kitchens and living rooms um, and uh, communal areas. You know, it's all about um, the price point and hitting the right price point with those where people actually in this time, if there are big layoffs, you know, if there are people getting laid off in certain areas that were renting a two bed flat or a house or whatever, or, or owned a house, they may consider selling and downsizing. Um, maybe they split up with a partner during during COVID. I've heard a few stories there where yep. people haven't had the best marital experience. No, okay. But um, so you mentioned the student market there. That was another question. Has anybody got any thoughts on what's going to happen in the student market now and how to survive it? It'll come back like anything there. else. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Whatever we're looking at now is short term. I don't totally agree with that, Tony. I, no, I, I me don't, neither. Some of it I don't think is short term. I think, I think, for instance, people working from home, um, for a lot of people, it will be long term. It, it's a better quality of life. It's better for the, it's better for the environment. Yeah. Um, and they're saving, you know, five, six thousand pounds. Some of them not travelling yeah. to London. So, yeah. I, I understand they need to go to London now and again, or wherever their office is now and again to see people. I accept that. With universities, you would have thought it is short term. I agree, Tony. However, but is, is it though, John? Because well, actually, no, I'm no, hearing no, that I, some of them are in financial well, difficulty. It's funny, funny you should say that, uh, really, because my stepdaughter, who has just got a second degree in law, she's hardly seen her tutor in two years. That in a year, they she she did it on a, in a, over a year. Basically, they're either off because they're off on strike this year. Or that it's COVID. It's been a disgrace. She's paid a fortune of loads of money out, and she's hardly seen the tutor tutors uh, for more than probably twenty days in the, the year, and that's disgraceful. And I think actually, if people are going to university from home, you know, work from home with it, like Open University, of course, is, is what that is, isn't it? Maybe, maybe you know, we, everyone's had all these universities have had a fantastic time with this accommodation and so on. They charge a fortune for, you know, maybe the maybe the tables will turn, Tony. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it will be different, Kate. Um, but I, I, I certainly, if I was a uni, if I was investing in university accommodation, I'd be very careful at the moment. Take take Sheffield, eighty thousand, eighty thousand. You know, university students in Sheffield, that, you know, it's a massive, if they, half of those don't turn up in September, that's a massive loss to the city, massive loss economically. Yeah, I think my nephew's going back there, so they've got one. Well, that's something, isn't it? <laughs> 79,999 to go. Absolutely, so we're all right. Um, so just to, just a quick comment. Yeah, sorry, sure. sorry, just a quick comment on that, Kate. Um, it also depends on what type of student accommodation you're talking about, because there's a big difference between buying a house next to a uni and renting it to three students yeah. and yeah. purpose-built student accommodation, which quite often is new build. It comes with a rental guarantee and it's more commercial property than it is residential property, because obviously somebody can't buy it to live in it. You can only ever sell it to a landlord. And the value is heavily based upon the yield, almost almost solely based upon the yield. So 
that type of thing you need to be a bit more careful with because quite often the rental guarantee might be five, seven or 10 years. Once it runs out, what do you do with it then? Yeah. And is there actually a secondary market for it? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And just leading on from that, we're asking, getting a lot of questions about what's going to happen in the commercial loan market. Mm. Oh. <laughs> To get the answer, ask the question, what lunatic is going to lend anyone money on a vacant commercial property unless it's got an alternative use? They won't lend. They won't lend. Simple as that. Unless you've got a lot of other assets and they're lending on those other assets, not on the commercial property you're buying. And that's going to, John, isn't it? That's going to help tee into the PD rights for developers. Yeah, but, that but can you've got to remember on PD, uh, Nicholas, and you know this, and you didn't mention it, but I'll just remind you, is that not every property that if you can do PD on, you should do PD on. Because oh, no, of course. Because it doesn't suit the area. It doesn't, you know, 100%. if it's very commercial, you might be able to develop it. But who's to say you can refinance it at the end if it's in a very commercial area, you know, um, you know, People like Richard will say, sorry, but we don't want to, we don't want our clients to lend that, to, to borrow on it because yeah. um, it, it's not, it's not acceptable lending. So, of, you know, you've got to be super careful and, and just mm. to say, oh, well, you know, yes, you can develop it. Doesn't always mean you should, is really what I'm saying. No, yeah. and the, the, the PD under B1C is the light industrial, isn't it? That's been in for a couple of years now, I think. And that's not really taken off at all because no. most light industrial is on a trading estate and it's not suitable. Yeah. So it kind of... <laughs> Fell a bit flat, didn't it, that yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. So another quite good, it's a good question, this one, because uh, it'll help. I'm trying to pick out questions that mean you all, you get as, I get as many answers as possible. So this is from a lady who has been made redundant, sold a property uh, a week later, built up a large amount of equity, which she's now looking to invest and start a career in property. So if maybe I can have just a couple of minutes from you each so we can get through as fast as possible. Um, what uh, would you suggest is the best strategy? And she's got buy to let and flip, but there are lots of other things they could be doing. So yeah. well, you've each got two minutes. Paul, we're going to start with All you. Right. Yeah, okay. I'm going to be a little bit harsh in a response they probably don't want. Go and get another job. Yeah. Don't quit your job to do property when you're just starting in property. Yeah, she didn't have it's, much choice on this one. They were well, no, I understand that. <laughs> You know, I, I would highly encourage her to go and get a job. Okay, oh, well, and that's an important point. And, and you build you're a property that. portfolio on the side until it is substantial enough to provide the income she needs. We deal with a lot of people who have done exactly what she's done, and that's usually our first thing. We say, look, you don't want to. Sorry, I didn't hear how much money was it that she's has has from the property sale. Um, we haven't got that information, okay. but she's just said a large amount. Okay, well, look, it depends how large is large. Yeah because that's subjective. Um, but yeah, look, we do with a lot of people who, you know, have inherited 50 grand and quit their job. And that's just madness in, in my yeah. view. Um, property is a slow burn. It's going to be very difficult, especially as a beginner, to turn over that money quickly enough to, to, to make it a full-time job that's profitable enough to be yeah. a full-time job. Yeah. Um, and I think most people with any experience would agree with me on that. Okay, um, Richard, whoops, I'm going to cut you two minutes there. Yeah. So that's a good, good bit of advice. Go go, try and get another job first. Richard, what, where are you heading to? Uh, well, I would say, similar to Paul, I would say don't do anything straight away because, you know, too many decisions are made quickly um, and you come to regret them if you haven't done your research. You're not clear what you want out of it. So it depends what she wants to get out of the investment in the future. There are things that she can do with the money short term while she's deciding on her own strategy. So she could invest it in various ways, various platforms, so that it grows and generates additional income while she's planning her own strategy. But I would say take your time, do your research, to talk to people like Paul, get advice on what the options are, but slow down. You know, one of the things... Yeah, I agree. And haste are, fair, are rarely good decisions. It's like that money's burning a hole in somebody's kind of back pocket, isn't it, yeah. really? It'll be a very large yeah. one. John, what's your just quick couple of minutes? That two I minutes. I hate agreeing with Richard, although he's a good friend of mine <laughs> all the time. Now, it's not. Another one themselves um, and don't really have much track record. But, you know, I would like to iterate that, you know, good education and the right education is is critical. And, you know, there's lots of low hanging fruit out there and all of us, um, including UK, we put out lots of good ebooks and books 
yeah. Um, yeah. Property Forum. We've got Property Tribes, a good friend of ours. You know, we're yes. all out there giving good information for free to get you to a certain point. You know, and I and I talk about this in all of, all of my talks about this sort of funnel of education. Get the low hanging fruit. But you know, that'll get you so far. Um, uh, but then, you know, you've got a little bit more knowledge. You can go to the next level of, of books and maybe some very well researched courses with good, legitimate people behind them. Um, and that, you can work and with... that's actually why you guys got together, wasn't it? Because yep. you were sort of really frustrated at some of the rubbish and, uh, you know, absolutely. Testament we want to, to you we... guys. You, you, de you do what I like about this is that you're actually doing the projects here and now. And when you talk a lot to the guys that are up there talking and telling you how to do it, actually quite a lot of them are, well, some of them are and they're bankruptcy or they've got high court cases going on and those sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got another um, quite specific question, actually, which I quite like. I have a 75% loan to value mortgage. If prices fall by 10%, then the, the mortgage company could demand 10% from me, which I don't have. Do you know any lenders that don't have this clawback? And I guess, is, is that actually something that they need to worry about? Or do you think the, the rules, if you like, and what the government's doing will help them through this period of time? Is that mortgage in a personal name or a, 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 a via a limited company? I'm going to assume it's a personal loan, Tony. Yeah, and I don't think it really matters. Um, in my understanding, and I am the principal of the mortgage brokerage, um, is that the vast majority if not all mainstream buy select products, they cannot ask for a revaluation. I think a lot of people assume that they can, but most cannot. It's usually only a commercial arrangement, yeah. which is quite often, and that's not, that's not necessarily to say for a limited company, but more so for a larger landlord that might have 20 properties and has one lender across them all. Yeah. Usually in that case, they can ask for a revaluation is more of yeah. a commercial loan. Whereas with the vast majority, as I say, if not all, and I'm not sure if it's all, but I know it's most of them, um, they can't ask for that. No. And that's um, what makes it so low risk because yeah. it doesn't really matter if the value falls by 10 or 20%. So long as it's still rented and you're no, confident it will recover. Okay. And if, if that said, so, but can they do it if it was their own home? No, absolutely not. Even less so. Uh, as, right. long, as, long as, they, as long as they keep up with the payments. I mean, as long as they keep up with the payments yeah. and the mortgage and that's, term that's, is yeah. long that's enough. Why what, that's why what Paul does is so it's so good, because to be honest with you, bit bit boring, but it's very good. And the reason it's so good is because over the next 20 years, you know, the market's gone up 5% year on average, and, and we know it's a micro market and so on. But at the end of the day, it's super safe. If, if you're not an entrepreneur, if you're not a, a, if you don't want to be a trader or a dealer or a developer, then what Paul offers is, is so, is so good. It's such a, it's so strong because, you know, it's safe. And, and, and for that main reason that even if the market goes down a little bit, you know, no bank's going to start pulling it off you uh, as long as you keep up the payments uh, on, on on the mortgage, which is the yeah. same for any mortgage. And we are going into this recession with 20 percent of people renting. In the last recession we went in and it was just under 13 percent. And that's very interesting. That is. I'm going to write that. I'm going to write that down. Private rental market. Uh, yeah, we've got another one which is quite good here. Yeah. Uh, which is, is it a good idea to buy new builds off plans in this situation? <laughs> Can I start with that one? Yeah, yeah. I, no. I can't sense you were about no. to. No. Have you got something don't to sell, John? It. Don't do it. And the reason you don't want to do it, because you don't know, if it's not going to be ready for a year, in a, say for a year, you don't know where the market's going to be in a year's time. You know, if you want, if you want to do that, go and put some money on the horse or go and put it on the stock market. Okay. Yeah. Look, I, I I disagree with that. Um, I think it all depends on the individual opportunity. Um, you know, if you're buying a good property in the in, in at the right price in a good area, that you know, for example, I, I've I'm currently uh, committed to buying three off-plan properties personally, and because of their locations, I'm very confident they're going to be worth but, but the Paul, right price, Paul, if not more, by the time Paul. they're done. With all due respect, you are, you are not the average. You are not the average investor. And and the average, you know, with all nothing is average. I appreciate that. But you're not the a, a newcomer investor. And to be honest with you, why would you why would you commit to any any property if you don't know what it's going to be worth in a year, a year and a half's time? 
But to be fair, again, I think it depends on the individual opportunities. People who are maybe new into the market. So as long as you've got, it's possible if you've got the right advice. Maybe that would be the other one. I'm going to move on to another one, which kind of helps with this. Um, so you, yes or no is the answer to that one. Um, if you're buying with cash, and I'm quite interested to your answer on this because I know what mine would be. On average, what sort of percentage discount would you expect off the price? <laughs> Why are you buying with cash? Yeah, that's a very good answer. We'll go to that one second. But I, my understanding is your chances of getting a percentage off at the moment it doesn't matter whether you've got cash or not. The, 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 so one, the, the, one, the one the one the one thing I always say to people in a in a market that's gonna get tougher is is actually it's it, it's almost not the best price that, that should count. It's the best buyer. Hmm. So at, at the moment, okay, everyone seems okay, but going forward, it's the best buyer not the best price uh, because you want certainty your deal's going to happen if the market starts to slide you need to get you need to make sure you you've got a, a buyer that can that will proceed and obviously if someone is cash much better chance of proceeding than if someone isn't however yeah. if you are but a cash that, buyer I but would it doesn't necessarily into, mean you can get a deal at the moment with the market no 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 but no. going forward yeah. going forward yeah. We always advise anybody that if there's two buyers, one at more money than the other one, one's cash and one isn't, which one do you go for? You go for the cash yeah, one. Yeah. And Tony, you made a good point there about why. Why? So I think it's sometimes good to buy with cash if you can yep. get a discount. But there's a real thing about holding with cash now as to whether that's going to pay back with such low property price growth that's built yep. in. Actually. Do you want to explain that to people? Tony? OK, so um, th there's good debt and there's bad debt. Yeah, and with interest rates so low, you know, um, e even if you're borrowing 50% uh, loan to value, you know, you're, you, you're, you're probably going to get a greater turn on your money by you by using you know half of your cash as opposed to all of it. Once that cash has gone from a liquid to an illiquid asset, you can't spend it again. And who knows that you may you know you may not be able to mortgage that property um, when you want to. And there, are, there can be restrictions on if you mortgage in to take the money out and so on and so forth. So once again, it depends on the circumstances, depends on whether you're looking to, you know, grow a wider portfolio. But I'd say don't buy with cash unless it's really going to be, you know, your principal private residence and you've got pl plenty of other money lying around and you can't be bothered to take a mortgage. Yeah. 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 I think it's almost an impossible question to answer as well, because I think far too many people go into deals with a set criteria of an X discount to make this good. But that's, again, it doesn't apply across the market. No. Yeah. Um, and Nicholas, the one for you, which is the best channel to find for um, commercial property? The best channel was that? Yeah, where, where do you go to find commercial deals, basically? Um, I would say the best tip would be to make good friends with your local commercial agents and surveyors. Mm -hmm. Now, commercial agents, and John, it'd be interesting to hear your opinion on this, is they tend to be a lot worse at, <laughs> at, at promoting deals than residential I would, agents. I would call, I protect, personally call them all lazy, and some of them are my friends, but I still extremely call them lazy. lazy. <laughs> Compared <laughs> to the residential agent, they're not very proactive. Right. No, and they, they don't market on major portals like Rightmove or Rarely yeah. because there's an extreme, you know, very high cost for that. So they yeah. stick it on their own website, they send it to their local database, yeah. and that's about it. And they hope to get a deal, or they stick it on Escape States Gazette or something like that. So yeah. that's a port yeah. to look at. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say definitely the biggest tip is drive around the city, see what your, your target city. Again, sourcing should be knowing your strategy, knowing exactly what you're looking for and being laser focused on that, sending out those requirements to all those local agents that are relevant, meeting them all, becoming their friends. That's the same yeah. for residential as well, by the way, but yeah. for commercial, it's even more impactful because mm. they, they, they're just lazy. They, if you've been in the door that day and they get something in a couple of days that matches your criteria, regardless of who's on their books, they'll probably call you because they're like, I know this guy's looking now. So it's, it's even more important to get on their books, speak yeah. to them, make, make good relationships, look for properties that are for let on a commercial basis. You might well find, that's a good tip that I use all the time, is it might not even be for sale. It might yeah. be for let or it yeah. might be all inquiries. Yeah. And that's where you can go and ask. You might have been sat in the market for six months vacant, all these, even more so in the, in the coming months, 
more yeah. of a distressed seller. And remember, with property sourcing, you're also looking for the seller, not just the property. It's a combination of the two to get a good deal. So for let can really help you find distressed sellers more easily. Um, hopefully, it's been vacant and they're dying for you to take it off their hands. Yeah. Um, I have to say, one, one has come in, and this is a um, comment, really. Fantastic haircut, John. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> nice. that was that's is that your wife, John? John? And, uh, just tickle me. Just worth it. That was all worth it. Makes it all worth it. <laughs> I've got another question, which is um, about the residential development market. How's that sitting? Uh, Richard, well, do you want to come in on that? Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, You're not you... Richard. Sorry, sorry, I just you misheard. Sorry, Richard, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> you got a lovely haircut, so you can just look at everybody and do side to side. But Richard, do you want to answer that first? Carry on, Richard. Thank you, Joan. Uh, Kate, what's the question? Where does uh, the resident? Yeah, what about the residential development market? So getting into physically developing properties for resi, is this sort of good time? What are the issues to think about? I think, um, well, uh, it's the market that, is, that is, is being affected by what's happening at the moment in a number of ways, and it depends on where the development is in its state. So if the development hasn't yet started, then um, it's not too bad. If it's midway through and it's almost finished, then, it, then, then it's uncertainty about the exit because of sales and so on. Um, we have a we have a strong uh, feeling about the, the residential development market in that whatever happens, the country is still going to be short of 300,000 houses or, or um, units. And so they need to come from somewhere. Everybody needs somewhere to live, whether they're going to rent, whether they're going to buy, they need somewhere to live. So we believe there's always opportunities in the residential development market. The challenge is choosing the right opportunities. And I think if you refer to all the things we discussed earlier, they inform, you know, how to go about it if you want to get into residential development, choosing the right area, looking for areas of regeneration, targeting your market at a particular audience and so on. And those things will always be true. Um, so I don't think it's a bad time. I don't, it's probably not a good time for your first development. I think if you know what you're doing, it's fine. Um, if, if you're about to start doing residential developments, then I would perhaps wait a bit and, and see how things go, because the more certainty, the more likely you are to succeed. I think that would be my general thought. And back to the lovely John with his beautiful haircut. Thank you. Uh, I, I think what Richard said is absolutely right. If you're three quarters way through a development, get it finished as quick as possible, because then you can get it sold this year, hopefully, and I don't think you have any problems. You probably won't have any problems the first quarter next year. But after that, you know, if you're if you're about to start, uh, if you've got a if you've got a, a an out before you have an in, in other words, if you've got a, a, a second option, which um, you know, if they if they're, if they're small properties, it may well be to rent them and then refinance them. I think that's that's fine. But if you if not, if they're bigger detached ones, I think I'd just be a little bit. I just want to see where the market's going more first. Uh, and just be cautious. Um, interestingly, the one thing I was going to say was that I, you know, I, I don't do a lot of land, but I, you know, I, I got people, friends of mine who do, and sometimes I got offered land and I pass it on to them, and all of them are being very negative on their prices on land. So, so if you have if you have agreed a price three months ago on land, you know, I expect if you go back and renegotiate that, um, you won't find that the agent will find another three people who will pay more than you will. Yeah. So I would, I would just be, I would just be wary, just be wary. Okay. And Nicholas, one for you. Um, where do people find out about the PD rules, and um, where do they look for the confirmation of changes? Um, well, mo obviously, there's there's lots of commentary out there from the likes of Savills and and Knight Frank, and all the major agents will be posting information. But ultimately, um, you can go onto the planning portal website. Um, I think. It's planning.gov.uk, something like that. I'll quickly do no, there that. Well, there's the planningportal.co.uk. Planningportal.co.uk. Um, yeah. That is almost certainly going to have updated plans once they're available. Um, but, you know, good old Google, it's not It's not rocket science, not a, not a hard question to answer, I'm afraid. It's out there and it'll be out there in the public domain and, um, you know, fairly straightforward. The PD at the moment is fairly straightforward. There's, I'd say, only four criteria. But what I would stress to anyone looking at these PD, it's not a blanket go out and do stuff and just crack on. Um, there is you know, stringent building regs to new build standards required. Um, there are these four criteria and you still need a good planning consultant to make sure that you know, before you exchange on something, 
to make sure that you've got these elements in order and you've got good reports for highways, <laughs> contamination, land, acoustics, um, you know, noise contamination before you put in your prior notification. Do that work up front. It'll save you a hell of a lot of money and time if, if, if it goes wrong. If you're prepared and you give the council a reason to not uh, refuse it and, you, and you've done good quality reports from good quality, well-known consultants in the industry for the various fields, um, the council will find it hard to refuse it. Yeah. One, one, cut, just a very, two very quick points on that. The two things that people get caught out on are cycle, that they have to supply um, cycle storage. And if, 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 of course, if it's a building with no external space, that can be very difficult. And mm. the second thing they get caught out in is bin storage. So they're the two things the council yeah. can turn you down on. So be very careful that you've got both covered. And this is a real area, I think, where some stuff you can, as I was saying earlier on, educate yourself by reading yeah, and, absolutely. Um, all the free stuff. But this is where it gets into real specialist. And Pers um, Personally, I would never buy an office building without already having PD on it. Right. before I bought it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and I guess on land, one of the questions is, so I mean, I'm, I'd like to do it for a plot of land, build a few houses, one, one for me too. Um, are, are we going to see some really good prices coming in? So this could be a good time over the next 12 months to get some land, sit on it for a little while and then start building as we start coming out. Is that a, is that a good strategy or have I crashed and burned myself already? Um, Richard, what do you think? Uh, well, we don't fund land deals. I'm not an expert in buying land, but um, I, I feel like you have to, well, personally, I'd have to be fairly certain that it will get planning permission in the future. And mm. around here and areas where we work, um, the planning decisions can be pretty unpredictable. So uh, I think if you get good advice from a planning consultant who knows the area, and they have a pretty good feeling about this, the likelihood of you getting planning one day, then it's probably a good time. But, yeah. um, you know, planning rules change all the time and planning departments change all the time. Personally, uh, it's not a risk that I would be willing to take. But people do, as like John says. I, I, yeah, and I perhaps didn't. So my understanding on land is you should always buy when it's got outline, mostly when you're looking, it's got outline or planning permission already. Well, if you've got outline planning permission already, then I think that's fine. But if it doesn't have any planning, which is sort of strategic land purchases, then I I think you need to know what you're doing. Do you remember those days in, um, we were talking about a property investor show early on, where people were selling those plots of land, which they just split up agricultural? <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. That was like one of the biggest shark things ever. And I don't think ever any ever one of those plot deals has ever come to no. fruition. No. Uh, the scary amounts of money that those guys made. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we've got another one. Somebody uh, just trying to uh, look at these ones coming in. Uh, done that. We've got um, somebody saying basically with the home moving model. We have just sort of heard this news on Huawei maybe being kicked into touch uh, now, or definitely kicked into touch. Um, is that? I mean, do you do you have a sense of something like not being able to do 5G and that kind of thing? Is that really going to impact that badly? Is it something? investors should be worried about or is it noise we can ignore i think it's noise we can ignore for um, for the time being uh, but most people I was are hoping you're going to expand on that there oh, I, can't expand. <laughs> okay. so I can look at some more questions go ahead tony no, look, we, 4g works pretty well you know uh, and to have our own uh, infrastructure is not such a bad idea no i i, I shouldn't worry about it too much I, okay, think part, else? I think part of the problem. John, yeah, yeah, Nicholas, I, I, you're, you're sitting there on your big, on your big pipe. With all I, your... I think I think part of the problem, Tony, is is you know people like Vodafone have already geared up massively in terms of staffing levels for 5G and delivering it. Um, I know there's a, a Vodafone HQ up in Newbury, so yeah. there is an issue there that you know there might be layoffs and it might lead into layoffs. You know, a lot of uh, telecommunications companies and, and everyone down that that entire chain. It's a big industry. Um, you know, could affect jobs. That, so I think that's the that's the risk. But who knows? You know, I, I think, think you've got I, to... I, I, what I would say. I think it definitely affects. And we had a sale fall through in Norfolk the other day, apparently because the, the he tested the the, the the broadband and it wasn't quite good enough for his business. Now whether that's an excuse or not, there's yeah. ways of boosting these now. I know, uh, and that Nicholas knows all about it. I haven't got a clue. But um, so I, you know, I, I do think that. 
broadband, if people, more working people working from home, it is important to people. Um, and of course, if you're, living, buying, if you're moving out and buying a bigger house, um, you can afford to have some fancy booster, probably, you know, some serious, serious stuff put in it. But, you know, certainly that's the benefit of being in the city, isn't it? Is that the broadband is normally a lot better than it is in the country. Yeah, yeah, and I know um, some surveyors actually uh, take that into consideration. Yeah. So they certainly will record that uh, on their services. Richard, did yeah. you want to come in there? Well, yeah, I was just going to say I'd, I'd probably disagree with Tony unusually. Um, 5G is much more than faster broadband. It will enable all sorts of services and, and use of technology that we probably can't even imagine today, and they will be coming in three, four, five years' time. Mm -hmm. So. In order for the country to be competitive and post-Brexit to lead in certain areas, particularly the related to technology, I think it's important that we are, you know, at least on a par with our competitors from a 5G point of view. So I think it is serious and I think it is important. It's not directly related to property, right. but it will impact the way our society develops and progresses yeah, and how we with that, the market. That I would agree with. Well said, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so we're kind of coming up to the last 10 minutes. Um, the one thing we don't really do on these calls and, and still won't is uh, sales pitches. When you go elsewhere, you get 10 minutes of information and then uh, uh, the rest is just a massive sales pitch. But do you want to each just um, maybe highlight and say how, just not as a sales pitch, but if people want the help, what's the help that you can give them? Paul, do you want to uh, run off first there? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, to tie into what we we're saying before, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market at the moment. People want some guidance or at least a sounding board on how best they can go about things confidently. And essentially, that's what we do for property investors. So we help people set goals, put in place a strategy for achieving those goals, do the research and due diligence on sourcing the right properties in the right locations. We finance them, we manage them, and then we help people review and reinvest as time goes on. So if anybody has any questions or any uncertainties, they'd like to go about investing in property in a relatively passive way. Um, you know, unlike John, who will help them with property development, uh, we help people take resources and invest them and not necessarily create a second job. Um, if anybody's interested in exploring that, then we can help them. OK, and I know you'll do some better help for free as well, won't you? And Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, the I'm whole, right, whole side of the process is free. Yeah, one of the differences is you're not just a broker, you're actually financial advisors. And I, that's right, isn't it? That is yep. a critical thing. Um, yep. Is thinking, linking is, is that we investors spend far too much time looking at a deal as opposed to looking at it. I've got 50 grand. Where's the best place for me to put it? If you yep. get the financial advice first, that will help you understand whether a property deal is correct or not. And, and you've hit the nail on the head there. I'd say that's probably our biggest point of difference to most yeah. other property companies is we're much less about the properties and much more about the person's strategy and their goals. Yeah, and you're regulated Yeah. by the Financial Conduct Authority So um, and have to have qualifications, which uh, others don't always have. Um, John, do you want to kind of explain the sorts of things that, uh, that you can help people with? Well, I'm... I'm a bit selfish because I'm busy doing my own stuff, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do I do a little bit of mentorship where I do, it's called acquisition mentorship. So people for 12 months they can they you know they, they can throw as many property deals at me as they're looking at, and I can go through them with them and go through it with them and advise them. Some people look at it a bit like an insurance policy, really, not to make yeah. a, a, you know, a silly mistake. So that's well, one thing I do do. second pair of eyes is always wise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they can bounce things off me. You know, some contact me every other day. Others contact me once every two months and, and so on. So I do that. Um, also, I do my, I've got three seminars based on my three books. Uh, and hopefully we're going to go live again in the, in, in, in London in, um, in September on those. We've got Zoom ones in August. Um, and also I've just started, I'm just, we're about to launch our, our, our high net worth um, listed property bond, uh, which is a five year bond. So oh, that? uh, that's something that I can't broadcast because you're not allowed to uh, promote oh, okay. it as such. But um, if anyone's interested, have... they can always come and talk to me about that. Okay, yeah. cool. Tony, do you want to just explain why you are Mr. Essential uh, to investors? Well, whether, whether investors, property, looking at tax, want to write their wills or anything like that, the number one question I'll ask them is why? You know, people come up with a lot of things about going into property or not going into property. 
But the one question that nobody ever bothers to ask them is, well, why do you want to do it in the first place? Yeah, good yeah. question. Well, yeah. yeah, and a lot of the stuff we've had today, you know, I didn't get the chance, but it, it, um, it's why, why are you trying to, that um, person who said they've you know, been made redundant or inherited a substantial amount of money, why do you want to spend it on property? Yeah. Yeah. Once you've got that, then it's making sure they understand where they are, really where they want to go, and they've got the right, efficient business structure in place from the outset. You know, ultimately, not just with me, but with all of us, the only thing we really sell is that which we know and they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's three ways, aren't there, that you can be classed or you by HMRC. It's is it property investor, property trader, uh, and I'm trying to remember what the third one is. Well, they're, they're, developer, they're, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. And they all attract a different way of taxing you, and I don't think a lot of people understand that. They think you're in you're taxed separately to everything else just as an individual buy to let investor i think it's really misunderstood it is if you're if you're uh, taking on properties where the sole purpose is to collect rents for 12 months or more whether or not you're in a in a company or in your own name you are effectively treated as running an investment business on a passive basis you won't be taxed accordingly if you're a property developer the, the other rules apply, particularly for land land banks. Yeah. You know, and if you're trading in properties, once again, there are a whole different set of rules apply. Yeah, and that's if you're flipping and things like that. That's so it, is, it is, I think it's probably it's <clears throat> the biggest eye-opener I have on the, on the tax side. Richard, tell us about your crowd rules. Well, I, uh, without going through the full risk warning, I can't really promote crowd rules, but I would just like to say that within the sector as a whole, so within alternative um, investment platforms, this might be a good time to consider using them because it enables you to diversify your risk and, and put in less and, and um, therefore not put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, that's true for us as it is for our competitors. Um, so that, that's the reason why I think it's something worth considering right now. So pop, pop over to the site and maybe just understand the model a little better um, and because a lot of people don't and um, and I was unsure I must admit I was quite unsure of it from the start frightened frightened the living daylight out of me to be honest but um, I have to say when you meet Richard and you kind of look at the things he's doing and some others as well then uh, I felt much more comfortable with the kind of uh, with the with the idea. Nicholas you got sorry over to you Nicholas before we lose them again. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I mean, yeah, just from my perspective, we're developers um, first and foremost. Um, we develop um, commercial buildings back to residential. We've also got a large HMO portfolio and we're still buying HMOs, um, a professional um, grade, high end, almost studio like good ensuite rooms. Um, ultimately, um, we're looking to work with private investors that um, want to invest their money on a hands off way in, in a similar way to Richard's platform. It's a way to invest in our development firm um, into a loan note structure. Um, and we essentially then use that money to buy and develop properties. Um, and we secure your money across multiple sites in our group. So as we grow, you grow with us and the security actually gets stronger as you go. So um, some really strong uh, returns available there and lots of good UK based security um, to secure your money on. So we're always first and foremost looking for uh, safety for our investors. We're investors ourselves first and foremost as well. So um, we want to make a, you know, we've created a product we think is highly investable for very hands-off investors. Um, I also mentor people. So if you're looking to get into office to residential conversions, HMOs are probably my two strongest areas, micro studios um, and sort of general property development, um, reach out to me at one of my websites, nicholaswoolwork.com um, and have a look at the mentorship uh, offers there. I do one-to-one -one mentorship. So again, it's kind of people that have come off the back of courses, hopefully good courses um, and not the bad ones, but you know, I can help anyone that's got a good level of knowledge already and can take it further. I'm looking for people that can, um, you know, that, that really need the practical side to help. And, and a bit like John does the, the, the acquisition mentorship, um, you know, I do a similar kind of product, but it's, it's really helping people, uh, isn't it, John? And it's, it's taking that knowledge and turning think, analysis paralysis I, I think, into action. I think, Nicholas, <laughs> it, I think the most genuine thing you can say about what you do and, what, and others like us is that we're adding value. Yeah. <clears throat> so whatever they're spending with us, which isn't very much, actually, it's adding value. And people must remember that it's a big ticket item. You know, buying yeah. a property probably is the most expensive thing they ever do. 
getting it right is brilliant. Getting it wrong can be very expensive and yeah, cost a lot more than what we are meant. What our mentorship fee oh, is. Oh God, yeah. yeah. Especially over the next Completely couple of agree. years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, so we are kind of nearing the end. Thank you so much for bearing with us. With uh, I know we've lost you all a few times, so uh, I do apologise that for that. But I'm hoping we've answered all of your questions. Uh, if you do feel a question um, you haven't answered, you can contact me at propertychecklist.co.uk. There's a, a contact there, and certainly on the market, that's the sort of things that I will be able to help you with. Um, but you've got Paul on the finance and buy to let side, Nicholas will help you certainly on the development side, Richard, if you're looking at alternative investments to maybe hedge your bets over the next sort of year or so, and John very much kind of on the acquisition side, and of course, Tony um, on the tax side. So I hope that uh, despite losing you a few times, um, that uh, that was really useful and helpful. And uh, we're going to be doing this again uh, as well. Have you got the date for the next one? Or is that coming up? Well, I think we have one penciled in, don't we, guys? Does anyone remember it? <laughs> penciled in. <laughs> it would be nice if we knew when. It's sometime it in November. We're going to do one in November, but we also got the big one in January, which we hope to have where, Tony? Um, that's at Lord's. At Lord's. Yeah, yeah. 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 bring, bring your cricket back. Bring your pads. We'll have a little game. End of January. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so hopefully, so we've got a couple more events. So do keep in touch. Uh, and as I say, if there's anything else that you need from the guys, um, just shout uh, and ask for their help, because I know they'll be, they, that's the primary aim of, of all of us being here today for you, free of charge. Yeah. Uh, so, so, sorry, guys, just what's probably worth mentioning there, that they just found the dates. So we were at Lord Investment Show at Olympia, pending oh, yeah. that show proceeding, uh -huh. which at the moment it's planned to. So if it does proceed, that will be the next Property Summits event um, in the auditorium. Uh, yeah. And then and then potentially another one in October prior to prior to January. Yeah. Yeah. And January, hopefully, uh, hopefully somebody will have found a vaccine and we can all meet up and not worry about this horrendous virus that's hit the world. Um, but as ever, opportunities available um, if, you, if you've got the right thinking. So um, really, thanks very much and look forward to seeing you again. Any comments you've got, things we can do better, um, always keen to hear those. So uh, do let us know and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.